why did the robot cross the road? Um, during this talk, we're going to talk a, uh, a little bit about computer vision, uh, robotics, and mobile games, and of course, JavaScript. My name is Pavel Shumshkovsky, um, and it's pronounced more or less like you see those emoji up there, like Pavel, Shrimp, Chick, Coffee, Ski. If you get that, it's close enough. Um, you can tweet stuff at me on Twitter uh, using at Makenai, M-A-K-E-N-A-I. Should be written at the bottom there as well. Um, hello. I am from Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm into a lot of makery things, um, electronics, robots, 3D printing. Um, and I work in Vegas at a small startup called Wedgies that does online polling. Um, has anyone ever played this game, seen it, or knows what it is? No? Yeah? Some? OK. This is uh, Crossy Road. And if you haven't played it, it's kind of like an endless frogger. It's a mobile game. Um, one of the popular features of this game, besides being an endless frogger, is that it has lots and lots of unlockable characters. I think over maybe now 160 different characters. Um, and like a lot of mobile games, it's kind of pay to play or um, like you have to either pay real money, 99 cents per character, some of them are more or less, or you can earn virtual coins in the game by watching advertisements. Um, and not wanting to spend lots and lots of money. Like, you tend to watch advertisements, but it's very tedious, and, uh, and the ads are kind of, kind of boring. Um, through my cursory knowledge of robotics, I know that uh, robots are good at automating certain tasks that are either too dangerous, uh, too precise, or too tedious for humans. Um, so I decided that a robot must be the answer to all of my problems. And so this talk is a story about uh, finding a robot and, const uh, and uh, programming it in such a way to, uh, to take care of this tedious task for me um, and all of the uh, sort of yak shaves along the way. Um, the main thing with a mobile game is that it's designed for interacting um, with human fingers and using weird gestures like taps and swipes that are pretty hard for most robots to replicate. Anything that doesn't really have like sausage fingers, um, it's, it's, it's hard to do. Um, Luckily, this is one problem that's been solved already uh, for us. Um, this, is, uh, this is an open source uh, robot project. I, I really, really like open source hardware. Um, this one is called TapsterBot, and it's invented by a guy named Jason Huggins. Um, he made the plans uh, for it at, uh, via his uh, a company that he co-founded called Sauce Labs uh, for mobile testing, and he uploaded the plans to GitHub. You can print out, if you have a 3D access to a 3D printer, you can print out most of the parts of this robot. You just need a few things like uh, servo motors and, and some metal hardware. You can get it at most hardware stores. Um, if you don't have access to a 3D printer, you should look up your local hackerspace. I just started printing this one day at work because I was like, hmm, it seems like a fun thing to do. Um, now, Tapster is what's called a Delta robot. Um, it's part of a class of robots called Cartesian robots. Um, and they're Cartesian because it's named after the Cartesian coordinate system. Um, which means that um, it can move its business end or end effector, the, the pointy end there, uh, anywhere on the x, y, or z axis. A more common example of a Cartesian robot is something like a 3D printer. Uh, most typical kinds, like the MakerBot, the ones you see that, uh, that use rails, are, are they use specialized parts like belts and uh, linear bearings and screw drives and things like that. Uh, so they're rather complicated to build, but they're really easy to control. Uh, because there's one motor per axis, one motor per x, y, and z. And so if you program your, uh, your robot to move the motor on the x-axis, you can expect that it's going to move a certain amount, whatever you move the motor on, uh, on the x-axis of, of the printer as well. A delta, on the other hand, is really simple to build. It's only built of, um, made up of motors, three motors, again. Um, and then there are joints and, and, uh, and arms. Um, even though it's simple to build, there are no specialized parts. Like I said, you can print most of them. Uh, they're rather more difficult to control compared to uh, your, your typical kind of like a 3D printer type Cartesian bot. Um, you need to use um, a branch of uh, mathematics called uh, kinematics uh, to figure out where the, uh, the, the end of the robot is going to end up. Um, this is basically kind of an illustration of, of the, uh, the kinematic algorithm required for it. You can see the arm there labeled F moves anywhere on the YZ plane. 
in, in actually a half circle, but it's a, it's a circular, mo uh, mo uh, circular motion. And I believe, let's see, is it labeled J there, the, the, the joints? Um, those are called, uh, those are what's called universal joints, which are uh, more uh, like a ball and socket joint like your shoulder, so it can move anywhere in a sphere. And what it ends up being is you end up with, uh, with, with three spheres that can move anywhere on the YZ through the movement of the half circles. And where those spheres all intersect is where the end effector is going to end up. And that's a kinematic uh, e equation for, for uh, reverse kinematics for positioning this robot. So you just put in where on the XYZ plane you want it to go, and it'll uh, figure out the angles of each of those motors, which go between 0 and 90 degrees, where you want it to end up. Um, so Jason's Tapster bot actually came with an example program uh, to do that kinematic equation. Um, and it wasn't really usable as it was. It was converted from a forum post, which oh, it's not linked there, um, but on this, uh, on this website called Trossen Robotics, where somebody had taken the original formula from a white paper published like in 1970s in Switzerland and, and made it a little bit more readable, posted some source code in C on, on how to make it all work. Um, I took that example since I wanted to, uh, to, to, to use the robot itself um, in, in a more modular way than the example program provided, and I, I turned it into a module. So I, I, I took uh, a lot of the C-like code, made it a little bit more JavaScript-like, and uh, fixed up the forward kinematics equation, which takes the angles and tells you, uh, and tells you where it's going to, to end up, um, which is useful for things like... Um, like here, we're using servo motors, which aren't very precise, so you have to often adjust for the actual position of what the angles are, 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 uh, are capable of. So you do the reverse kinematics to, to, to go somewhere, and then you do the forward kinematics, and you adjust if it's, if it's off a little bit further than, than you think. I also added a queuing system so that the robot can perform a series of actions uh, in sequence, which is really useful for the type of thing uh, we're going to do here. Uh, and it's published on NPM as J5 Delta. Um, which is built on Johnny Five. Uh, if you haven't heard of Johnny Five, I think it's been mentioned in like three or four presentations already today. Um, it's an excellent uh, JavaScript uh, node library for controlling robots. You should check it out if you haven't. Um, so that takes care of kind of the motion part of it. Uh, now we have a robot that can sort of move and swipe things on command, um, but it can't actually see, which is the next part of it. Um, so it's another thing that's been invented. We have webcams. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Um, the, uh, and I had a few of these Microsoft webcams left over from a previous project. I thought, okay, cool, I can use these. Um, it turns out that most webcams are actually used for teleconferencing, things like that, and so they autofocus uh, by default. So I, 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 I couldn't use that. It, it becomes a problem when there's a, uh, an end effector pointer going in front of the camera, taking the focus off of the screen. Now it can't see the screen, and the focus is messed up, and everything goes downhill from there. So I, I Googled around. Um, I think I found this one on Amazon. So this, is, uh, this was labeled as a manual focus uh, webcam. Uh, you can turn off autofocus, that type of thing. But you can see there's no knobs like you might see on, a, on an SLR camera, so, and then no switch for, for autofocus. Uh, what it did have is this sort of software control panel for turning off autofocus with that checkbox and adjusting the, uh, the manual focus. Uh, I thought it wouldn't be a problem. I thought I could use it and just adjust it uh, before I did my, my demo or whatever. But the problem was that it wasn't really keeping the settings between sessions, and so I had to set it every time. And it got kind of annoying. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I can just reverse engineer this and figure out how to make it uh, you know, manual focus. I found a cool Adafruit tutorial on how to reverse engineer USB devices, and this one in particular focused on the Microsoft Connect. And I went down the path of looking at the tutorial. It all made sense up until you got to the point of requiring a USB logic analyzer, which was um, pretty expensive. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to go down that path. Uh, I did a little bit more Googling, and I found this project called uh, Video for Linux um, and discovered that most modern webcams actually prescribe to this uh, protocol uh, called the USB Video Class. It's actually a white paper put out by the USB Implementers Forum, and it has uh, like a mm, pretty uh, standardized control. Um, like uh, each each webcam can advertise its capabilities, and then the software can can uh, uh, configure the, the webcam through through this interface uh, described in this white paper. I also found some object Objective C code um, uh, to put the, uh, as an example that was pretty helpful. So I spent a couple of nights creating a node package for interfacing uh, via this UVC um, 
interface through cameras, and I put that up on GitHub as well. Uh, and I ended up needed a few more, needing a few more features, uh, including like auto white balance, which uh, will adjust the, uh, the the white balance of the of the camera based on you know what's on the screen, so that can mess things up and the brightness setting if your screen is too bright. Um, now the camera can see clearly and it won't lose focus, uh, but we still need to interpret what we're looking at. Um, so OpenCV is kind of the premier package for computer vision. Uh, it was created to uh, really further the field of computer vision research by grouping together kind of the most efficient and most well-known vision algorithms uh, for other computer vision scientists to build upon. Um, has a lot of bells and whistles. It does uh, face recognition and uh, gesture recognition and uh, motion tracking, things like that. Um, the problem is uh, oh, there's a lot of documentation for it as well uh, for the original C library. Um, but the problem is it's pretty daunting if you don't already have a background in computer vision. Um, or if you're like me and you look at those, uh, those formulas there and you think it just might as well be like elvish runes. It's not really my background. Um, this is a method I was looking at for image recognition called HU moments. And it's one of those things you don't really think of as like, oh, that's, yeah, I know what that does. That's, it's, you know, image recognition, right? It's like, eh. No, image moments has a very specific definition in the, in the computer vision thing. So it was, it was pretty hard to approach. Um, and uh, OpenCV is written in C++ natively. Um, and I found a nice looking uh, OpenCV wrapper. It's called Node OpenCV. Um, I think it's pretty much the, the most popular, or I guess it's just called OpenCV. Maybe the GitHub thing is Node OpenCV. Um, the, the wrapper library itself didn't have the greatest documentation. And that's pretty common, because normally for a wrapper library, you might look at the original uh, source code signatures to figure out what the methods are, and then just try to use the same ones. Uh, the problem was um, that with this one, the, uh, the method signatures were pretty different. They'd taken it and sort of made it more JavaScript friendly. But, uh, but in the end, I ended up having to go into the wrapper code a lot to look up what things actually did. So I was looking at a lot of this thing. Um, I managed to figure it out. It supported pretty much everything I needed. It just wasn't really documented. So I do have a, a to-do still uh, someday to come back and, and, uh, and, and work on the documentation for this and submit that as a, as a, as a pull request. Um, so the first actual uh, computer vision problem we need to solve has to do with image skewing. Um, so when you put the webcam off to the side of a phone, it doesn't see like a nice little rectangle like you see a phone. Um, it's, it's a pretty easy problem to solve. Um, it's what's called a deformation matrix where you pass in the, uh, the, the four coordinates where you, uh, of the original image and the four coordinates where you want things to, uh, to end up and it'll stretch everything out for you in a, in a nice way. Um, so this is kind of the, the source code to that. It takes the old corners and the new corners. You set up a, a, a perspective transform and do the, the matrix, and it, and, it, uh, and it does a nice unwrapping thing for you. Uh, like here, you can see the original image there and what we've de-skewed. Um, I tried to recognize the phone automatically and figure out the coordinates, but it was kind of too hard. So I ended up just writing this jQuery library of draggle points and, and ma manually configuring it. Um, if I can make that generic enough, I might open source that at some point. But it was a good shortcut that kept me going without being blocked on this one uh, problem of many. Um, that got me far enough to put together a demo app uh, where I could um, interact with the, uh, the image that was de-skewed on the screen, click at various points, and sort of map them uh, to actual points on the screen so I could control the, uh, the telephone from, from my web browser. Um, and it's basically using uh, socket I.O. Uh, and pushing the images to the web browser using an MJPEG URL and, uh, and just listening for browser events on clicks and drags. So that was a pretty cool first step. Um, this is an example of an image loop capturing uh, images from the webcam, processing the DSKU, and publishing events that can be listened uh, later on. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the uh, MJPEG handler in Express that basically looks for the image events and spits them out with a special header and boundaries each image in sequence. So it looks like an animation when you access the MJPEG URL. Pretty old technology, but it works. Um, Next thing we want to do is identify buttons automatically. Um, so OpenCV has a lot of methods for this, including things called sift and surf and moments like we looked at before. Uh, they're pretty resilient to scale and angle and things. But since we're de-skewing the image, 
uh, we can use a much simpler method. Uh, and there's a one called image match or match template match, um, where you just grab a sample of the image you want to match, and uh, and uh, and it'll recognize it with some uh, precision. Um, so here we want to recognize the play button. That's the image we're using as a template. Um, the code to initiate template templ template match looks pretty pretty simple. Um, you actually pass in the file name instead of an image handle, which has some performance things. Another thing I want to, to fix up. And then that uh, that t that three there, the tmccor normed is sort of a match method, um, and that should probably be defined as a constant, but it's not in there. Um, there are different kinds of match methods where it'll figure out the, the intensity of pixels and things like that. And if you want to know what they are, the documentation has it completely covered. You can exactly tell uh, what they all do just by looking at this, right? Um, or if you're like me, you can just sort of try them all out and pick one that seems to be okay. This is how the uh, template, ma template match method actually works. It just takes the image and slides it across, and then it outputs a, uh, another bitmap of pixel intensities, and you pick the uh, Whatever either the highest or the lowest pixel intensities are, and each method has a different um, requirement. Like some need low low intensities and some need high, depending on the match method. Um, so this is how that comparison looks like. There's a nice convenience function to get you the minimum and maximum pixels uh, for matches, um, or you can just go through the image and figure out and pick maybe like multiple targets. Um, but you're going to want to threshold them because if you don't threshold, you'll see. The first two images there have matches for the play button, but the third one found just like the closest one, and it didn't match above the threshold. So it's not, uh, it'll have a lot of false positives. Um, so now with the threshold in there, where you just compare like, is this above a 0.95 match or something like that, you can recognize buttons. Um, but we still need to add some control logic. Otherwise, you're going to have like, uh, like a computer program that tries to click all the buttons at once and gets distracted like a kid with no attention span. Um, even though I'd never used them before, I was pretty sure that if I tried to do this with like if-then statements, it would end up like a horrible spaghetti code. Um, so I was going to say, e even though I'd never used it before, I, I, I figured the state machine was, was probably the solution for this. Um, a state machine is kind of a conceptual model that dictates how something will behave depending on certain inputs uh, and what state it's in. This is a state machine map of a, uh, a coin-operated turnstile. So if you walk up to a turnstile and you push on it and it's locked, it's not going to uh, budge. But if you put a coin in, you transition it into the unlocked state, and then it can actually push. And once it, once it closes again, it'll go back into locked. And then the same thing, if you put in coins into an unlocked turnstile, it'll stay unlocked, but it'll let you through. It just behaves certain ways depending on the state that it's in. Um, so a good state machine library that I found is Machina.js. It um, has a lot of cool features, including hooks. Um, and, uh, and timeouts and things like that. So this is an example of Machina code. I'm going to brush through this because it's in the docs. But here are the various screens that we have on the app and, and the various states. So on the title screen, um, if you see the finger, you, you know that uh, the finger is inviting you to play, so it just taps anywhere on the screen. Um, and then we're in the, uh, the, the, the transition to the new state, which is now playing. Um, and in this state, we just want to tap the screen uh, until the character dies and we transition to game over. So it just taps every two seconds to move the character forward. Once we've died, um, we are in this state where either we're going to see an earn coin button, which is that one up in the upper right corner, or the play button. We don't always get the earn coin button. Uh, but when we see it, we click that one first and then transition into the watching commercial stage or state. Um, otherwise, uh, the only option is to play, so we go back to the title screen state. And then here we are on an ad. So in the ad, we're just waiting for 25 seconds until the ad video finishes playing. And you can exit out of the ad by clicking that X, but it's really a hard target for the computer to recognize, um, especially under various lighting conditions. So instead, we just tap on the screen, go to the App Store, and hit the Back button, um, and then collect our coins and, uh, and start the game over. Um, so demo, I'm running a little bit short. I normally do a hardware demo. Um, but I realized that 20 minutes is a pretty tight time for a, for a hardware demo, especially something this finicky. So I just managed to get this together and recorded my hotel room. So this is what the screen of it looks like. And you'll see me here with like, uh, there's the actual robot in the upper right corner, and this is the screen of the interface. Here I am configuring the boundaries of the, uh, 
of the screen. So you can see it'll be fidgety, and depending on lighting conditions, it might not recognize. On the left-hand side, you see it's recognizing the, uh, the finger. And as I change the focus, it, the, the recognition gets less or more. Let's see. I'm fidgeting slowly. Here's the focus. Changes that. It gets blurry. Let me go back and get it as sharp as possible. It's a lot harder to do this on stage, which is why I did the video this time. Let's see. I'm not sure how long this fidget's for, but I think eventually I hit the play button here. There's a lot of fidgeting. Zoom forward. OK. And here's where the transition is played. You can see the, uh, the robot moving in the upper right. And clicking there, notice the coin button. It clicks on the coin. And this is where, with the latest revision of Crossy Road, there's like a dinosaur thing. Now the ads are interactive. Um, so it won't actually continue until you swipe. The last time I did this talk, it was fine. So it kind of got tripped up there. It's, it's, it's really a moving target. So I would have to modify this to work with, with that. But here you can see kind of another close-up of, of a longer loop of the, uh, the robot working. So, um, and if anybody really wants to see this thing, just hit me up, uh, like tweet me or, or see me after the thing, and, and I, can, uh, I can set the robot up like in the, uh, at the breakfast tomorrow. So I think that's all I've got and all I've got time for. So thank you very much.